and thanks to you. Um, yeah, actually, I think, you know, Ian just climbed the mountain because I'm getting right near for after my talk. <laughs> I told I wasn't going to drive back down. Um, the other thing is I really have to catch my plane. So at 11, while maybe there's some discussion, I will be out that door with uh, Ian and a couple other people getting a ride with me. And if we're, yeah, I am. So, so because of that, please ask questions during the lecture any time. Um, yeah, I'm a Duke. This is a picture of Duke. I'm an advisor for IMQ. So if I talk about IMQ or any of his competitors, you can how you want. Um, what's wrong with this picture of Duke? Like, what's the nice thing in this picture? The church, the chapel, it's beautiful. Um, it's actually, I think, it's very interesting because uh, J.B. Duke wanted to be a European king. If you're a European king, you should have like a big Catholic cathedral, but they were Methodist. And so to me, the most interesting thing about this church is the art inside, because you have to have Methodist art inside of something that looks like a Catholic church. Anyway, God visit. Right, now what's wrong with this picture? Yeah, there's zero mountains. None, none. <laughs> I'm a person from the mountains, and so I always look at this picture and I'm like, yeah, good, it's fine. All right, I like Tell You Right a lot. Uh, this is a picture from 2018 here. Um, actually, I think what's amazing is we went on the site, I some of us went on a hike with me. Uh, both of these pictures are actually from that trip. So this one is near the top, and you can see at the bottom that little orange rope is kind of near that very fancy house up on the peak. And this one is closer to the bottom. It's almost to the middle of gondola stop. And that was the day where the visibility was, you couldn't get whatever. You had to ski 20 feet away from people, or you would never see them again. Here's the hike. Uh, looks great. Uh, thanks to Hannes for like setting up the camera and being able to capture us. Uh, more people made it to the top in this picture, but uh, there's a little bit of latency. Okay. So, what's the problem? The problem is, we don't have quantum computers because things are noisy. And I would love to tell you that the thing that's really killing us is vacuum fluctuations in fundamental physics, but normally it's really boring things like HVAC, noisy electronics, people are going up and down at escalator elevators, uh, maybe you live somewhere with public transit. It's great. So the better, the better our quantum computers get, the better we are at detecting trains, right? And so, so, so it's, it's a fundamental problem. All right, there are two ways to fix this. Uh, you know, I'm at heart a scientist, so I think everything's a Hamiltonian. I think the whole world's Hamiltonians. Um, but as we saw, actually, you know, from Peter's talk, the annoying thing is if you forget about just a little bit of your whole system, the part you're left over with is mixed, has some temperature, sort of noisy. And so we have to try to decouple um, our quantum computer from the environment. And we assume it's connected by some sort of interacting Hamiltonian. And so quantum control, um, which we do a lot of, uh, also in my group and over time, um, we just try to average away this interaction Hamiltonian. That's not it. But I call this fighting Hamiltonians with Hamiltonians. So if we think about errors as being gates, so I like to think about it, you know, you're in this lab code programming your quantum computer, and the devil is behind you also programming the same quantum computer. So the devil is sending in these bad instructions, you're sending in good instructions, and you have to somehow figure out how to get the thing to do what you want despite this adversary. And uh, John Preskill would call this fighting a single point, um, which is today's lecture. Okay, so some good resources. So first, um, everyone should read, you know, I spoke with Mike. Uh, it has great error correction in it. Uh, this Pascal notes, chapter seven is pretty good. And chapter eight, which is on topological um, quantum computing is also good. I really like this review article about quantum memories by Barbara Chernoff. I think this is really important because we're always, people have always been trying to dream up ways to make quantum memories in less than four dimensions. And they've always failed so far. But they actually always turn into super cool error correcting codes or procedures for distillation. And so it's a good example of how, like, aiming for a hard target, getting to the target is actually sometimes not really necessary. There's all kinds of cool stuff on that. Um, lately, people have been into these low density parity check codes. Uh, there's a really nice review article by Brooklyn and Everhart. And then I teach a semester long course on quantum computing. Uh, you can look at the notes here. 
They are not perfect. If you see typos, send them to me. Um, and they kind of peter out towards the end because I, you know, I actually, uh, next spring, I'm going to not teach this class, but I'm going to actually try to finish these notes. We'll see if it happens. Okay, so we start with classified correction. I always think of classified error correction as, uh, yeah, talking to my, to my grandpa on the phone. Um, I say, I'll see you tomorrow. He says, you see me on Wednesday? And I'm like, no, tomorrow, right? So, so there's a channel, and uh, most of the time it works fine. Say 85% of the time. And 15% of the time you get the wrong answer. And this one's a binary symmetric channel, which is kind of threatening. And so when you think about classical error correction, again, I just think about talking to my grandpa on the phone. Actually, my grandpa turned 100 this year. Um, it's pretty cool. Uh, it's amazing, actually. Um, so he, yeah, so you know, you just say tomorrow, 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 until he says tomorrow. Um, so we have this uh, repetition. Now, maybe he mishears the first time you say tomorrow, and you get to 100, which is nice. Um, and then every time you say this, there's still a possibility of mishearing. And so at the end, um, you have this kind of tree of possible messages that actually got there. And every blue arrow is like 85%, and every red arrow is 15%. And then what do you do at the end? And so one thing I like about error correction um, is that it's, I think, like a good argument for democracy. So you assume every person's reasonable, then you just let everybody vote. Um, and then assuming people are good, the majority vote should give you the right answer. And so here, if we do the majority vote, we see that um, we're able to improve the, the possibility of transmitting that information from 85%, which is if we sent one bit, to 94%. Okay, so I'm going to draw the same structure, but I want to now think about two code words. So the one code word is three zeros, and the other code word is three ones. So a single error maps you to places where a majority vote works, right? So if one out of three people made the wrong choice, we can fix it. Now, if two errors happen, the majority vote will flip, right? Um, and then, and then, and then we'll we'll miss we'll make we'll make a bad choice here. So key thing is one error step is correctable um, in this case, and generically it has to do with the the length of these code words and bits. So this is three bits, so the distance is three, so I can correct one. Um, two error steps are detectable, and this continues for larger code words, so it's D minus one errors are detectable. And if I have three errors, I basically have created a logical code word, so I can't see it, because I could have just sent the message one, one, one. And I'd be like, great, everyone's in agreement. Okay. Um, yeah, so we want to move to qubits. So uh, we talked a lot about the block sphere. Um, here's a you know, nice representation of States, there's a nice representation of these density matrices. Um, and then I'll use this normal, you know, X, Y, and Z, uh, which is capital X, Y, and Z, sometimes some X and Y. And so if we have a pure state, we live on the block sphere. If we have a mixed state, we live on the same. And so when people first thought about um, doing quantum error correction, people were like, it's not going to work. <laughs> so why not? So the first is we can't copy the states because of the known cloning theorem. We also want to preserve the superposition. So if I have the superposition of these logical zeros and logical ones, um, which we saw, yeah, we saw earlier this week, if a single bit flips, that's fine, but I can't ask to do the majority vote. Because if I ask to do the majority vote, I'll collapse into either 100 or 011, and I want to preserve the information. So the way we can do this um, without voting is to ask a question about agreement with your neighbors. So you say, hey, do you agree with your neighbors? Do you agree with your neighbors? And if everybody agrees, everyone's like, yeah, we live in a great neighborhood. It isn't, um, well, yeah. 
This is also, I think, like kind of current problem in American democracy is that we all live in neighborhoods or in neighborhoods. Um, we should try to fix that. Uh, the second thing is the, um, the, the check. If there, somebody disagrees, you can easily determine who disagrees. And you tell them, hey, you got to change your yard signs in that, that kind of neighborhood. And they change their yard sign. Um, but what's interesting is it doesn't matter what the signs are, right? It could, they could all be in favor of zeros, they could be in favor of ones, we can do these pairing issues. So we're going to move to, um, you know, very quickly into quantum stuff. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is forget about these bits that we're adding. And we're just going to think about two poly Z operators. So these two poly Z operators also allow us to do a parity check on these bits. I just made them cats, so we know it's one, and I can apply these poly Zs. And there's a direct um, connection to the bit strings and the poly Z operation from before. So this mapping between bits and poly Z operators um, is why the classical error correcting code can work just perfectly. Okay, so um, any questions about that? Repetition code, parity checks. Okay, so now we're going to add a little bit of, yeah, actually I like what Hannah said, like for some credibility I'm going to do a little bit of math. Um, or you're like, wait, isn't this already math? No, go, next step. So when I think about it, classical code, um, we can imagine a linear code. So linear code will have a generator, and this is the repetition code. So I send in one bit, which is zero or one. And so zero times one, 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 is zero, 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 and that's the logical zero state. One times one, one, one is one, one, one. That's the logical one state. And then these bit checks, I can write as a parity check matrix. So this H is the parity check matrix. And what it does is it allows me to detect errors by checking if the two uh, neighboring bits agree or don't agree. And so we can see that for code words, which are all generated from G, if we multiply h by g, we get zero. So, um, and then we can say fancy things if we want. We can say, oh, the code space is the kernel of h. Sounds good. Um, and then, and then I think one thing which is tough in the, uh, it's not, it's actually not that bad. But whenever you read an error correction paper, people talk in the language they're most comfortable. So uh, I like matrices, so I usually talk about matrices. Actually, I like poly operators the best, so I usually just talk about poly operators. I had to talk about matrices to talk about matrices. Some people prefer chain complexes. And I'm always like, wait, are you just talking about the kernel of a matrix? And they're like, yes, if there's a kernel of a matrix, there's a chain complex. Um, so when you read the literature, uh, uh, if, you have trouble, yeah, if you have trouble mapping things, just give me a call. And I'll do like these things and map like this. That's fine. Okay. So then how do we detect an error? So we have a code word one. And then an error will be a bit flip. So let's say we have an error on the second bit. And that error is just the addition of one to that second bit. And now we have our parity check matrix. And then it's just linear algebra. So H acting on the code space 1L is going to be zero. So the only thing we have left is H times U2. And we get this two-bit check, which says that one disagrees with two and two disagrees with three. And so we know that's the error. Yeah. Okay. I can actually rewrite H in a way where I it tells like the bit string tells me where the error is, but you know, that's like a choice of length. Now, um, again, <laughs> sometimes instead of writing down matrices. People write down graphs. So the Tanner graph is just a graphical representation of H. The black circles are the three bits, and the red squares are the two parity bits up. I can, of course, reorganize this graph and like pull it into a straight line. And then if I am a physicist, I just get rid of these red blocks and I put these red bars. And then I have this ZZ interaction between these bits. And now I suddenly have the easing model. So this easing model 
for like a coding theory person, is basically a canogram, which is written in a way which kind of doesn't clearly show the bipartition. So what's cool about that is we can think about increasing the distance of the code um, in two different ways. One is we can concatenate, so we can take small strings, and then we can have big blocks which check parities between these strings. Or we could have a long chain. And this is, yeah, looks exactly like the one to easy model. And we know that the ground state of this easy model is either all zeros or all ones. And those are our two codes. Okay. Now why uh, why does a 1D easy model, what's the what's the critical temperature of 1D easy model? Is this a clone simulation workshop? Zero. All right. And then uh, Alex, why is it zero? Yeah, there's no finite temperature phase transition, which is the same as saying it's zero temperature. Anybody else? Like, what's the, I, I know Alex knows, what's the, what's the, entropy wins, entropy wins. So, basically, here's your easing model. Now, those two X blocks, um, you may remember from Chris's talk, you know, we talked about, like, domain walls. So we have these two domain walls in the easing string. But those domain walls, from a coding theory perspective, are parity bits showing up in your parity check matrix. And so, thermodynamically, there, there are two problems. The first problem is that the domain wall in a 1D easing model can move for free energetically. There's no penalty for it to walk along. Um, and then the more important problem is, uh, entropically, all of these domain walls will start forming. And they all start moving freely and pretty quickly you're totally screwed. So there's no phase transition at the end for finite temperature. So air correction is not thermodynamics, it's basically kinetics. So what we do is we see these domain walls and we just fix the medium. And so as long as the number of domain walls that start showing up is not so big or there are so many errors, we can fix and repair these domain walls by bringing them back together. Like that, yeah. Actually, yes, yeah, so that's the yeah. And that's the other thing. Uh, so uh, lately I've been shifting more and more to like a classical error correction view of quantum error correction. But again, a lot of the papers are written by physicists. So it's like you have two charges and the charges exist and you bring them back together and then because they're, um, they're each their own antiparticle, they cancel. So that's what, that's what you would say about these domain walls. Oh, these domain walls are some kind of quasi-particles when I bring two domain walls together, they cancel. Um, but really, it's like you look at these parity bits and you fix this. All right, so as long as we catch these errors faster than the cosmological failures, life is good. So um, this classical error correction code uh, with repetitive error correction for two distances um, was done by John Martinez's group just before he moved to Google. And they were able to show a suppression of um, these errors by going from distance five to distance three. And more recently, um, they were able to go out to distance 25 um, easing models where they you know, wrapped it around. And you see this thing that we all want to see in um, error correction is an exponential suppression of error with distance. And then this, this end part is actually pretty interesting. So this flat flattening out in their experiment, it turns out to be due to cosmic rays. So uh, this cosmic ray will also be a problem for quantum codes, so we have to think about what to do about that. Um, but it's pretty, it's pretty amazing, this classical code. And then I'll talk a little bit more about it later, but this is the quantum code, and you see a little suppression, but not yet. Well, for one, you see we can't go very far in distance, um, and two, the suppression is not so much. Uh, Mike, can I pay you for one question? Yes. You actually uh, suggested earlier that there's a relationship between error correction and phase transition, but then you dropped the language of phase transition. Does that language have any relevance for what you just told us? Uh, yeah. So if I can make a code, if I can make a code which corresponds to a Hamiltonian that does have a finite temperature phase transition, then I would have a code which would be solved. Self-correcting if I can make a Hamiltonian. 
But if I wanted to build it in a fault tolerant way, it would also actually be single shot, which would be worth a lot. Um, which I I'll get I'll get back to single shot later. The second thing is even for these ones where there's maybe not a, a normal phase transition, um, the the percolation of these errors can be mapped to like a random bond model. And the phase transition of that random bond model actually tells you something about um, what error correction will work on. Okay. Uh, all right, so let's, so then normally, normally when I give the introduction, I only do the repetition code. Uh, but today we're gonna go a little bit further and talk about the next code. So this is a Hammond code, this is the 743 Hammond code. Um, I've written it in normal form. So there's like an identity at the top, and then this A matrix at the bottom. And the nice thing about writing it in normal form is the parity check matrix has the same um, shape. Um, this A times this. Um, and then the kind of remarkable thing is uh, effectively A plus A is zero because it's minor. And so this automatically tells me that the G of this parity check matrix is seven. I can write down my Tanner graph. Um, as you can see, the Tanner graph is more complicated because there can be, um, you know, the bits connect to multiple checks. Some bits, like this bit, connects to all three checks. Some bits, like this bit, only connects to a single check. Um, I can, again, I'm not doing anything, I'm just like stretching the graph around. And then after I stretch the graph around, I want to rewrite these as Z parity checks, and I get these four Z parity checks. And for those of you who know um, a little bit more about quantum error correction, this is the Z stabilizers of the steam field. Um, and so this, this, these, these pictures people draw um, really come from these Tanner graphs of the underlying code. So now a little stabilizer proposal. Um, okay, actually, uh, yes. seven bits, I encode it into four bits, then I have a distance three. But let's just look at this first one. So I'm going to have four bits that I want to encode into these seven bits. And so the first four bits here are actually going to correspond to that four bits of information. But then things are going to go wrong. So these bottom three pieces are parity checks to check that the addition of these initial four bits adds up to the right number. So then I compare the output I get here, which should be my four bit string, and whether or not that agrees with these um, parity checks down here. So when I switch to the parity check matrix, this A, right, is this check on these four bits um, that they did what they're supposed to do. And then it's compared to the bit of this parity block, which is why the identity is out there. Does that? That makes a lot of sense. And that's why I, I think then the other question I have to ask is you can do it in Tanner graph because there's these different levels of degrees. Yeah. Of nodes, right? Yeah. So what does that also mean? That's a great question. Uh, it does depend. It does depend on the circuit we use to, to do these things. Um, I do want to say that these stabilizer generators are not unique. So you could also pick a different set of generators if you, that was a concern. Um, and then just to go back to the initial part. So these three outer qubits, they represent these parity bits. And so they should be the value of whatever this is. Um, these four inner bits 
correspond to the information in the run code. And so they have to talk to all three pair units in order to figure out what's going on, or at least, at least two or three of them to figure out what's going on. That's a great question. Yeah, anything else on this? Okay, so stabilizer formalism. Um, how many people feel like they're stabilizer formalism experts? That's a raise your hand. So, yeah, I'm actually just trying to get back at you because he says I only listen to depressing music. But that's, I guess that's probably true. Um, all right, so we have poly operators. So, poly operators will be. Uh, they have only two eigenvalues, plus one and minus one. Um, and they, uh, you know, I will write them, my notes, unfortunately, are inconsistent if I start labeling them from zero like a robot, or start labeling them one like a human being. Um, but, but it should always work out. So sometimes I will only have, you know, x0, x1, you know. And sometimes I'll put all of the identities in. Um, just, I'll, I'll switch back and forth. So a stabilizer state um, is some state which is stabilized by some operator m. So m, if m on psi is psi, it's a stabilizer of a state. Uh, for poly operators, with n qubits, you can only you have n commuting independent, right? That's the key thing. Independent poly operators will stabilize one state. And so we know about this if we just think about a regular district: zero, one, one, zero, zero. Stabilized by z minus z minus z dt, um, because every poly operator cuts your Hilbert space in half. And so, if I have a two to the n Hilbert space at n qubits, and I have positive outcomes for n independent poly operators, I've cut everything down to just one z. So here's the z example. Yeah, looks good to me. Um, okay, so now just some quick notation. Uh, these Poly, the stabilizer is a group. The group is generated by some strings of polys. Um, here they're the z, i, z, i, z, i. Um, those generators are not unique. You want to think about them like vectors, a basis set of vectors for a vector space. You can always pick a different basis and have the same vector space. Um, now this little bracket there is not um, the mean. It means generator in group two. So those are the generators. And so this state is just zero, 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 because we have to have positive one for the first C, positive one for the second C, positive one for the last C. We don't have to be in the Z basis. We could have X basis, Z basis, Y basis. And then um, in my notation, for the X basis, I'll use plus, and for the Y basis, I'll use plus or minus I. Um, all right. So, uh, this is your quick question. Talk to your neighbors. What is the state stabilized by these three polyoperators? I will give you uh, three minutes. And talk to your neighbors, please. <laughs> I am from the school of electron lecturing where there should be exercises during the class. So. You guys are very quiet. Uh, if, you, if you're totally stunned, just ask me a question because other people are totally stunned.
period of time, uh, do I have a great volunteer? All right, now explain to our friends why it's not. So remember, this is important. So the bell state 0, 0, plus 1, 1 is stabilized by xx plus cc. Continue, sorry. And then, when we add the bell state, and then we remove all of the non bell state. Yeah, sounds good. Sounds good. I'm going to approach it a little bit differently on the next slide, but that's that's for the questions about that. Okay. Um, okay. So we can define a code space um, by not by basically picking less than n stabilizers. And so you may remember our initial thing was the repetition code. Repetition code is stabilized by ZZI and IZZ, because that's the parity check matrix of a repetition code. So when we go back here, we notice these last two generators are the parity check matrix for the repetition code. So we know just from those two on the right that the only possible states are 0, 0, 0, and 1, 1, 1. And then XXX is the thing which is the, the, right, that basically flips us from one code word to the other code word. So we have to have an equal superposition of those two code words for this thing to be stabilized. But if we think about it as a code space, we have S, that's one. Uh, we have one logical qubit, zero logical, one logical. Uh, we can define X logical. And so if we make the state have to be the plus one eigenstate of X logical, it's the same as an equal superposition of zero and one. And so it's just zero, 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 plus one, one, one. Uh, now this is the key thing about this, I mentioned the beginning, this problem of code flipping. So it, before people, before Peter Shore worked out the first example, people were worried because I can't have an encoder that would take plus to three pluses and zero to three zeros because it just breaks in the air, breaks in the air, actually. I mean, you check it. So, um, so plus logical operator, plus logical state, sorry, is just this equals position of zero, zero, zero. All right. So, uh, we're going to go back to some channel graph pictures. So we have some possible code. Uh, we see this domain wall. We fix it. It doesn't matter. What, um, we'll see in a second. So the way I think about it, and we'll, we'll look at this more generally, is that the eigenvalues of the ZZI and IZZ stabilizers split filter space into four separate spaces. And so the logical space is the blue box. The red, green, and orange spaces are detectable errors. And then if there's only been one error, we just map back to the blue substance. And this is just to show it doesn't matter if we were all zeros or all ones. Um, this particular error would map this from the blue space to the green space, and we just go back. Um, I, this is some gory detail where I write the wave function. We apply an X error. We look at these parity checks. We see that both of them will be negative. We then fix the middle one. We get back the right answer. Now the problem with this code, um, sorry, yeah. I, the problem with this code is if a phase error happens, seems fine. But these two parity checks, Z1, Z2, Z2, Z3, they both commute with Z1. So Z1 is just invisible. So we can't, we don't see any errors. We're still in the code space. And the um, overlap of our initial state and our final state could be zero, um, depending on, on what our initial, our initial state is. And so the problem is that we have these two distances. So um, distance for x is great, it's like three. But the distance for a single logical z error is just one z error. 
So classical codes are all like this, right? The only fixed bit of errors, base of error doesn't make any sense in a classical code. All right, so here's, um, um, I guess I maybe should have said, okay, so the picture at the beginning of the, the guy skiing is actually Dave Bacon. So Dave Bacon, uh, a long time ago, had this nice idea, uh, which is, well, we have other condensed matter theory models we can think of, and we could use those condensed matter theory models to build codes. So if I have an easing z-type interaction, I can fix bit pairs. So I have an easing x-type interaction. Going the other way, I could fix z errors. And this, um, this kind of, if I think of this as a Hamiltonian, people would call it a compass model. So you have this compass model. And so then the idea is, you know, an x error here breaks these two z-bonds. A z error here breaks these two x-bonds. A y error in the middle breaks both z and x-bonds. And life looks good. And then I really like this slide because uh, it's like a great example of lying through PowerPoint. Um, so it looks good, but what, what, what's the lie in this, this one? Yeah, my checks don't commute. <laughs> so they don't form a set of commuting stabilizer generators, which, which means for the Hamiltonian, um, these are not, uh, not, for the ground state, say, not all of these bonds can be satisfied perfectly as plus one minus one. But the idea is really good, right? <laughs> like you have, we, we fix these Z checks, we fix these X checks, life is good. So what we can do is we can take these bonds and we can put them together in a way which generates um, poly operators that do Q. And so we need to find roughly eight of them. And that's another thing to keep in mind, which is uh, I only have nine, I have nine qubits, these white circles, so I only have nine degrees of freedom. So if I have, uh, you know, in this case, 12 checks, um, I have negative three degrees of freedom left. <laughs> so there's no qubit for sure. So we only want to have like eight checks so at least there's one degree of freedom left. Um, and what I like about this compass code is it wasn't how Shore came up with the Shore code. Um, I'll talk about that next. And it wasn't how um, uh, the rotated surface code was discovered. Uh, from, 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 from Dave's work, he did find this first subsystem code. Um, and the, but, but it's kind of a nice way. I, actually, I really like to think about this one, right? I know Isaac model in Z corrects X, Isaac model in X corrects Z's, and then I just fix it by making sure these things can work. So the way the short code was actually discovered um, was that Peter realized that, okay, at the bottom level, I can fix X errors because I have the Z type model. And then I can write down these logical operators X and Z. So then at the next layer, I'm gonna make a logical X type easing model by using these big logical weight three poly operators. So this logical easing model operators will be weight six, which are these blue squares here. And that fixes my logical Z to also be just this three. So it's, a, it's, it's just the concatenation of two repetition groups. Um, and this is the full stabilizer group at the bottom. And that is why people usually just draw pictures and don't write out these whole stabilizer groups. Uh, here's just a different picture where I've written the stabilizer group um, located out on the edge. Um, okay, now the important thing in error correction is that we don't see, um, we don't see errors, we only see checks. So now we have these two X-type stabilizers that have turned on. So then talk to your neighbor and think about a poly error that won't commute with those two weight six X checks, but will commute with all of these C checks. And if it's too obvious, say Ken, this is too obvious, come on. When I say talk to your neighbors, I really mean it.
Jake, my first, what's one, what's one thing that does this? All right, so Mingyu is saying three Zs down the middle. Z, Z, Z. Um, anybody can do it with less than three Zs. One Z, where do you want In the middle, great. Can anyone pull it off with two Zs? Yeah, it could be two on the outside. Yeah, I see that. You just say it. On the edges? Yeah. Zero Zs? Yeah, no luck. Um, all right. So, uh, well, you can actually pull it off with the Y and X. It's a homework problem. Find the Y and the X. Um, so the. Uh, so the um, so here are just three examples: Z in the top, Z in the middle, two Z's on the side, and then we need a decoder. <laughs> so we don't know what the error is, and so we 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 can't. We, yeah, we don't have that microscopic information. We only have these checks. So I always just fix the one at the top. So if it's at the top and I fix it, Z times Z is identity, and I just fix. It's the one in the middle, I get z times z. The z times z is this stabilizer. It's exactly this little red check. So that also vanishes. And then if they're on the edge, um, this error leads to, I put the z here, I use the stabilizers to move these z's up to the top, and now I have a logical z. So it's like what we expect from repetition code, which is, if there's one Z error, I fix it. If there's two Z errors, I have logical error. Okay. What is the uh, assumption of this decoder? Like, why? Um, like, maybe I came to you and I said, hey, I think we should always have this. We choose, the decoder should apply these two Zs. You would say, that's crazy because what? Or you'd say, oh, that's a good idea. Because then we wouldn't have any logical errors. And then this one turned to logical error. Anybody? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. So if we, if we work under the assumption that single errors are more likely than two errors, then this is a great decoder. If you have a model where actually errors always come in pairs, you should pick a different decoder. And I think our, our normal decoder for quantum error correction always assumes these um, uh, kind of independent error probabilities on different qubits. So low error decoding, low weight decoding is the usual thing we do. But when you actually go and do work later, you should build a decoder that fits your most. Um, so I'm gonna um, just, we can go out. So we can write down this angle of long error correction condition. And it basically says um, we have logical states and a set of errors. And the errors that we can correct cannot map one logical state to another logical state. That is, they can't be somehow a logical operator. And so that's this delta JK. They could be the logical identity, right? And map back and forth. The second term, um, says, um, I think of it as a contraction of the vector space. So your vector space can get smaller, but the lengths, that, that change in lengths, can't depend on what the logical states are. Because if it depends on what the logical states are, you can end up with an effective rotation, and you create an awesome logical operator. Now, stabilizer codes are the best, because either this is one, or it's zero. And so you don't see this contraction. But when you look at things like Lausanne codes, for instance, then that contraction is a very important part of doing the design of those codes. So moving to error correcting codes uh, quite broadly, I just think of it as you have, um, well, okay, uh, I'm gonna soapbox quickly. Um, here's the thing, there are no qubits. Zero qubits. <laughs> Every physical system has a ton of bubbles. 
And the first thing that we do is we just pick two of them, and we call that the qubit. Sometimes people will be like, oh, Ken, what about single electrons? I'm like, yeah, electrons have velocity, position, and momentum. Uh, nothing, nothing is a qubit. So the first thing we do is we have this huge Hilbert space, and we say, hey, we like these two levels. These two levels have low noise, these two levels are easy to control, there's something good about these two levels. So that's our first cut. And then what a quantum code does is it makes the next cut on a collection of these uh, objects, these qubits. Um, and it makes a cut which isn't about the stability, but really about distinguishability. So you make a cut so that errors aren't stopped, but if they happen, you can see them. And you can fix them. So I think of it, I think of, um, yeah. Like my idea of building a quantum computer is you have this massive Hilbert space, and then you have a hierarchy of ways to choose parts of that Hilbert space, which makes it stable. The first part is kind of passive stability by picking good qubits, and then the second part is active stability by, by figuring out how to make the errors detectable. Um, okay, so, uh, yeah, I, So, so normally we use double square brackets for quantum linear codes. I actually think it happened because of physical review. I think we used to use single square brackets. And single square brackets are how references are done in physical review. So when the physical review papers were put on, I think they added a second bracket. But maybe I'm wrong. Um, anyway, so I sometimes just go back to this old notation. Um, yeah, so short is a nine metric code. And so the question is, like, what is the smallest n, like, code that can correct a single error? And the way to think about that um, is we need to balance errors in space. And so each qubit can have three possible errors, x, y, and z. And I want to be able to correct all of them. And so then I have one plus three times n parts of Hilbert space I have to distinguish, times two, because I have a logical qubit, and then the total number of, the total size of the Hilbert space has to be bigger than that. So the smallest thing that I can fit this in is five, um, and uh, yeah, I want to have a break, which is normal, I would make you sweat this out. Um, uh, but the, uh, so there are these different choices of codes. So the 513 code, has these x, z, z, x, i top operators, it has less qubits. Uh, the steam code, um, which we'll talk a little bit more about how to get it from two classical codes after the break, um, has seven qubits, and actually has a lot of gates, because the x checks and z checks are the same. And the short code um, is, and, is really asymmetric between x and z, but it allows you to fix more difficult errors. So if um, this question about the types of errors, like if you had more bit flip errors, then maybe, you know, short codes of issues. Everybody loves the surface code. This is a rotated surface code. Again, it's nice because it allows us to achieve this question of um, the compass code. So if this X error happens, these two red checks turn on. That Z error happens, these two blue checks turn on. Um, right, the Y error happens, red and blue checks turn on. So again, so now, uh, yeah, we'll do one last exercise. Um, so what, yeah, what are the errors here? These are the checks that you're on. What are the, what's the smallest poly operator so you can make that create these errors? tell it is this y error because the red and blues both turn on. So there's either an x and a z or a y. And then here, yeah, we just flipped across x and z. So please work it out. So now in practice to do this, um, we have to make circuits, which we'll talk a little bit more about 
turn out for the cookie. Um, again, this is a, just a diagram of the distance five code from our friends at Google. Uh, the, um, this is the gate sequence of how to monitor and checks to measure these things. Um, and then you see the kind of important thing we'll also talk more about is that the errors are not the same, they're not uniform. Um, and so that's another challenge when reading the literature is usually the more theoretical literature assumes all error probabilities are the same. <laughs> but in actual reality, um, for the, yeah, actually for the case of um, the Google experiment, the thing which is actually really getting them is their measurement error. So single cubic gates are quite good, two cubic gates are good, but the measurement error little bit above 99%. Um, so, on, on average. So, uh, yeah, so anyway, it's cool. That's great. I think it's amazing that we were able to do this checkerboard code. Um, and if we can think about the errors that could exist on here, I'll leave this for you to, to puzzle over. Um, actually, the thing I do um, in, my, in my regular classes, I give people a distance seven surface code. I ask one person to make checks and the other person to decode it. Um, which is actually a good exercise you should try out. It's interesting to see what people do. But with that, we'll take a, I guess, a five minute break, 10 minute break. What are we doing? We'll take a five ish minute break, come back a little bit after 10. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, it's it's straightforward from our perspective.
So there's a new project in Philly, which I'm you know, really out of here at the moment, which is called the Burton Project. And uh, so it kind of says that if there's about 23 people in a the room, there's a 50% chance at least that two of us have a better chance every day. Um, and there's a lot of people in this room. <laughs> and so we can go about this in like a number of ways to see whether there's two of us who actually have a better chance every day. Um, or we can kind of just say, you know, today, for example, just at a social, uh, just take a punt, you know, like Matt Moynihan, for example. It's your birthday today. Yes, it is your birthday today. Go <laughs> ahead and come up and, uh, and, and select some, uh, some water. <laughs> Take another coach pun, for example, like Nathan Fitzpatrick is at your birthday today. Oh, <laughs> 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 um, and is it by any chance like anyone else's birthday? No, or if it has you, you, you have to, one more water. <laughs>
you know, surface code. Okay, uh, so, so you had this thing which is interesting. Surface code was invented in 1999, roughly. Um, nobody cared until basically 2007. And there's a nice paper by Rosendorf and Harrington which showed that I, I'm skipping another very important paper. <laughs> uh, but browser over narrative showed that you could do computation um, with the surface code with the super high threshold, and suddenly everybody cared. And it's kind of interesting to me because it took, you know, roughly a decade for that to happen. In the meantime, people did a lot of work on concatenated codes because they thought it was more practical. Surface code seemed kind of impractical from a computation point of view. So I think it's useful to think a little bit about like where can we get other codes from. So I'm not going to go too much into CSS codes because you can read about CSS codes in uh, Russell's notes, um, in his book. Um, it's very common. Uh, so it stands for Calder Bank Scene Insurer. Um, it, these codes came out roughly in 96 or so, uh, for the initial codes. Uh, Robert Calder Bank is my colleague at Duke, and I talk to him all the time. And I think it's part of the reason why I personally move more towards just, just doing the error correction coding and forgetting about the mapping to physics. Um, but he always draws these pictures. So the top thing, F2N, is like Rn. It says you have n bits in a vector, or a field, a field. Uh, and the code is just a sub, it's basically a vector space of that larger vector space. And the way a CSS code is, it works is there are two codes. The second code, is a subspace of the first code. And then the dual codes, which correspond to um, vectors that are orthogonal to the original code, uh, allows you to generate both the X and Z type operators. And what's nice is the X and Z type operators are totally distinct. So when you look, um, I should try to tell this, but like the short code, the steam code, are both CSS codes, obviously. Surface code is CSS code because all the checks are X and Z, whereas the 513 code is not because it contains X's and Z's and X's. Um, now, the, uh, yeah, yeah. so just as a quick example for the Steam code, Steam code is really nice because C2 is C1 dual. And then if you're, I think that to me, um, at least for me, when I first started working with these uh, these binary fields, is that um, basically the inner product of a vector with itself can be zero. And so these dual, a lot of these dual code words are in C1. And then what happens in the dual code is basically the generator and the parity check matrix change jobs. Um, and I would say my main arguments with Robert is like which one. Uh, if we can agree on which one is the generator matrix and which one is the parity matrix. And then also, uh, as a scientist, I like column vectors. And as a mathematician, he likes row vectors. And once all those things sort out, everything's fine. But it's a, nice, it's a nice thing. So you can see, so what I want to point out to you is that these, um, these three, these vectors here, which are weight four, end up being the stabilizer for the checks. Because um, they're, they're embedded in these H parities. And this one, which is weight 3, becomes the leftover logical operator between C1 and C2. Um, yeah, and that leads to the steam code. And again, um, I'm skipping it. I'm, I'm not going into any more detail about these. This way of constructing CSS codes, because there's a lot of good resources everywhere. And normally, if you take a quantum error question class or have the quantum error question part, Computation class, this should be a little bit on CSS codes. So in 2009, um, Tillich and Zemmour introduced a different way to take two classical codes and make a quantum code. Um, and these codes are called hypergraph product codes. And so to do this, what we're going to do is um, we're going to take two Tanner graphs. And we're um, going to stick with our like main example, which is a repetition code. 
And I'm going to draw them suggestively uh, is, you know, this side and that side. And then obviously what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a product. So this is a graph product code. This is actually just graphs. Um, but, but it works fine. So the rule is the following. So um, in this lecture, classical bits are usually represented by these black circles, and then quantum bits by these white circles. So whenever two classical data bits come together, they become a qubit. Whenever two check bits, the red bits, come together, they become a data qubit. If a black check, or if a, if a data bit multiplies by a check bit, it's going to become a z-check. But uh, in my notation, I, it means uh, it's made out of z operators if I look for x errors. Um, and then if it's the other way around, so there's kind of a non conductivity right? So if the red guy multiplies by the black guy, we get a blue extension. So then I just do that. Um, yeah, actually, if you have pen and paper, just take a second and try to write down what this, this empty point is. Only 25 symbols, it's not so bad. And then I'm, I'm assuming that the column here is the left multiple, the thing on the left. Super speedy, want to say what the code is? Well, it's, it, this one is, ends up not being, it, it's, it ends up not being kind of small, but it does end up being the surface code. It ends up being the non rotated surface code. So here's the picture. Um, and then this is the, uh, the, the connections. I, I skipped the rule about connections, but you can see things sort of. Um, and because of the rule about the connection, the red checks and blue checks will all, always um, connect on an even number of data cubes, and usually just two. So as a result, the, um, the, the, the commutation between the X checks and blue checks is fine. So yeah, so this is just the regular surface code where you have kind of triangular syndrome checks on the top or on the side. Um, and then you have you know, two types of boundaries, uh, you know, blue boundaries and red boundaries. So. Uh, so what's cool about this, again, this is not how the surface code was discovered at all. Uh, but it really highlights that, um, that you can really think of it as a product of two repetition rates. Um, and this also, I think, kind of highlights the weakness of the surface code, which is the logical operator is going to correspond to those underlying uh, classical codes. So that distance is going to go like L. But the overall um, number of qubits you go is going to go like L squared. And so I think to me, uh, what's funny is the um, surface code is also a CSS code. And I could write down the C1 and C2, which correspond to the surface code. But no one ever has. And the reason why is the C1, which is the surface code, which would lead to the surface code, is a terrible, terrible classical code. No one would ever use it, ever. And so it's like a, it's a missing, um, it's, 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 it's interesting to me. So it's nice from a physics perspective, because we can think about these expectations and charges and things moving around, um, but 
But from a coding perspective, it's, it's just OK. So what's nice about these um, hypergraph product codes is that you can take any two codes um, and you can like put them together. And the number, this, um, yeah, uh, also in the spirit of I just want to just double check that this equation is right. My, um, my, uh, uh, my, my notation differs a tiny bit from Tillich's and Mark. Um, and so, but, but I, I think it works up. But basically, right, the number of qubits has to grow quite a bit. Uh, what's amazing is the number of logical qubits uh, grows like the multiple of k1 to k2. Um, and then the distance uh, is kind of a problem. So it's either the distance of one and the distance of two. But in reality, you really just have two distances. You have an x distance and a z distance. So if you have more x errors or you have more z errors, it makes sense to build one of these codes that has a larger distance for the, the error that's more likely. Now, if I assume that I have super good classical codes, uh, which in this case I mean both the number of encoded bits and the distance are linear in the number of bits. Then when I work through this math, um, you basically now have m data qubits. You have O of m logical qubits, which is great. Um, but the distance is limited uh, to be the square root of the number of qubits. So surface code is off. Uh, Surface code is L squared one L because uh, it's not a good code, and so the number of encoded qubits is low. Uh, but this kind of square root of n problem was like a real problem for a long time. So, um, so, so what I want to yeah. So this is a little bit of a detour, but you'll see we'll pop back in a second. Okay, one thing which drives me crazy is uh, I go to the you know. I'm always trying to get people to do error correction. And people are always telling me, uh, Ken, you can't do error correction, you need thousands of qubits. And then I always say, like, why? Like, why do you think we need thousands of qubits? And I, well, I heard, I heard, I heard a thousand qubits. So this thousand qubits number basically comes from this 2012 paper by Feller et al. Um, they say they want to get to like really low logical error rates of 10 to the minus 14, 10 to the minus 15. They assume that um, our physical error rates can't get much better than 10 to the minus 3, which may be true. And then they calculate how many qubits you need using this equation. So the logical error is equal to the uh, physical error divided by the threshold. There's this constant that was missing in Rob's talk, but you know, it's close to one. It's fine. Um, and then raised to the distance of the code so when I take the log, this distance allows me to calculate how many qubits I need um, based on the error that I want, and the um, and basically the uh, yeah, and, sorry, and then the, the physical error. So the bad news of this, okay. So the good news of this plot is that error correction exponentially suppresses error. The bad news is you actually see that P, um, being right at threshold is really bad. The P significantly below threshold, it, you don't gain that much if it gets much smaller because it comes in logarithm. So going from going to 10 to the minus 4 would be great. Getting to 10 to the minus 5 uh, for this particular code may not help much. The thing which really matters is D. And then for the surface code and for hypergraph product codes in general, we have this problem that d is equal to um, square root of the number of cubes. And that's for the thousand function. The other thing which is missing in this is that this is just like one qubit. So then I this is I have a thousand qubit over n for this one qubit. Um, or here, the one n one qubit. So when this paper by Tillich and Zemmer came out, it wasn't, uh, yeah, it, you know, they're, they're, they're excellent coding theorists. Um, and I think to me, the paper which like really illustrated what the one possible game could be was this paper by Kovlev and Priyanka. Because it makes it super concrete. 
So say you have 450 qubits, and they're in this um, service code with periodic boundary source of torture. Then you have two logical qubits, and the distance is 15. Now, if you make a different hypergraphotic code, this is actually a hyperbicycle code, you will see the stabilizers go from being these little waveform stabilizers to these much more extended you know, waveform five, six, seven, eight stabilizers. Uh, the logical operators become smaller, so they end up being, um, in this case, distance five. But now you have 98 logical qubits. So that's that's the that's a big trick. So if you live in surface code land, you live in a very tiny parameter space. When you start to think about codes that allow you to encode more logical qubits than the physical qubits, you can then make these trade-offs and say, do I need to do more error suppression, or do I need to um, have more qubits? And then this is actually a place where um, you know making the physical error lower can help, because these thresholds are, are generically lower than the surface code. Um, but it's cool, it's cool. I think it's good to think about. So this question of finite rate codes, where we could have both constant depth and constant rate, all these things. Um, there's a nice paper by, by uh, Daniel Gottesman in 2013, where he basically says it should be possible. Um, but LinkedIn has done a lot of really uh, cool work, which has allowed people to, to reach this limit um, using these different types of codes. And so that's, I think, super promising. And in fact, over the uh, pandemic, um, yes, uh, sorry, I have a later. So I should say on this, this code um, from, yeah, I've lost a set. I don't know why I have a citation on this slide. But this, this paper from Microsoft with codes with thin planar connectivity, they are able, if you get to an error rate of 10 to the minus 4 in their paper, you could you could encode 50, you only use 50 physical qubits to encode the logical qubit. You get the same error rate of a thousand logical qubit um, surface code for having code. So that's an example of one of these things. Eberland. Yeah. Eberland. Beverly, yeah, Beverland, it's, yeah, Beverland Del Boss and Trumpet. Yeah, I have, I have it later. I, I, I usually have it just stuck to this picture, but it somehow so anyway, over the, the, the last couple of years, um, it's been amazing because there's suddenly a series of a series of works which basically starts from hypergraph product codes, makes some small changes and transformations, and leads to quantum codes that are have this asymptotically linear property, um, which is very cool. And there's like a gazillion uh, I just find it really interesting because um, once somebody found one example, suddenly everyone could find examples. And this paper by Yamasaki and Kawashi I like a lot because they don't do anything fancy. They actually just use concatenated codes. And there's no reason we couldn't have done this with concatenated codes a long time ago. But somehow we, 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 I don't know, we were missing this piece. Um, all right. And so I, I, I encourage you to think about this. The other thing that I'm always thinking about is these kind of decadal things. So surface code was invented, but wasn't really useful for a decade until we had a way to do um, good error correction, et cetera. These first good codes, at least with good encoding rate, from Tillich and Simor, from 2009, we didn't really have really good examples until basically 2020. So, uh, so two things, one is, Think about things which seem maybe not so practical right now, and try to imagine in a decade what it would take to make them practical. Try to do that. Um, but then also, uh, things are, uh, it also just takes time for these ideas to bubble over. So, so make sure you're following these things. Okay, so, um, yeah, any questions? I, yeah, this is a very thin sketch. Actually, the details of like the spontaneity of the Kalasha paper to get it to work are pretty, in my opinion, um, are pretty intense. I don't know, what do you think? Like, very intense. They're very intense. This Yamasaki Kalasha paper I find pretty relaxing. Um, but I, I don't know any way that I can actually explain the handling of the Kalasha paper in the 
time I have remaining, so I have to stop here. But any questions about um, binary codes? Yeah. Um, that I don't know. I don't know. Um, I know. So the so so the so in this paper, which doesn't quite get to the n distance, um, is one over fifty, which is quite nice. Yeah, can you can you say a couple words what you mean by the word practical? Because um, that assume. Uh, special memory, are you also assuming the dates may be easy to do in those codes, or is a, we're able to figure out other dates? Yeah, so um, that sort of brings up a lot of good questions. Uh, okay, so that, um, surface code has a really great threshold, and we know how to do dates, and that is worth a lot. Um, but that is also because there's been like a decade of concerted effort to like improve these things and make them better. The problem with these other codes, as you can see on the left, there are two problems. One is threshold will be probably lower um, because the stabilizer checks that higher weight. That's not an ironclad rule, but that's like a reasonable estimate. But they're still finite. It's not like the, the size of these checks grows out of control. That's why they're low density. The second problem has to do with um, the connectivity. So I need a way to have qubits talk to each other which are distant. So if I wanted to, um, uh, you know, a topology like say, that like I've made a super connected circuit and things only talk to neighbors, then, then that's impossible to read the surface code. Because if I had to do all the spots, it would be one system thing I should forget about. If I was, um, you know, like Hannes was talking about the neutral atoms, where there's really no lattice, you're just moving around these tweezers, then this thing is not a big deal. No. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that, that's a great question. And so this paper here uh, by Bemmel and the Microsoft group, um, they want to try to convince you that you can pull this off by having effectively, let's just imagine they're superconductors, like 2D arrays of superconductors, which are connected by resonators in the plane, which you can think of as those black lines. And then you need some resonator connections to the to up and bottom. Um, and then I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll say my usual joke and hopefully they'll keep forgiving me. Uh, what I really love about this picture is the top layer has almost no lines. So it looks really quite friendly. <laughs> and the second layer, there's a ton of lines. <laughs> there's no reason that second layer couldn't be on top. But if you put the first layer on top, it looks much, routing problem looks much nicer. Anyway. Um, so so uh, back to Setsu's question, uh, what I find really fascinating about this, this era of codes which requires not near standard connectivity is it tells you what the gain is for you to put in the cost to change your hardware. And then you have, you, um, you have to decide if that cost you. And, it, and, I, and I hate to say it, but it could just be the case that Surface codes, we use surface codes up to some point, and then maybe we encode the surface code into one of these binary codes to do the next set. Because um, once, um, so once you have a surface code and you have the ability to move logical qubits around, move defects around, you effectively have full connectivity again. And so you can sort of like shift it around. Yeah, any more questions? Yeah, so that, yeah, so I, I also switched over that. So that is, that is a big problem, is we, we have a default way to do things, which is effectively through teleportation, where we take some logical operator out of the block, and then we try to map it back. Um, there are some cases where you can do logical operators within the block. Um, I actually think maybe it's a, a free research topic. I don't plan to do it. If any of my students are planning to do it, you can play the demo. Uh, but you know, this piece by Small Tolerance um, from, from Ted Yoder is a really nice kind of um, correction to this transversal top gate between two big and short curves. And I've always wondered if there's some peaceable type of way to do these intra block logical operations, but I don't know if it works for them. Anyone? 
just claim it. So if you, if you want to do it, you can be left from the audience. Um, okay, so I've been super excited lately in that uh, we actually have all kinds of quantum error correction experiments. Um, I was involved with this experiment with uh, Chris, where we implemented the Bacon Shore um, code. Uh, most of the pieces, except for repeated measurements. Um, there's been really amazing work um, out of Quantum uh, using uh, the scheme code and uh, being able to really create, actually being able to do a logical two qubit gate, which is better than a physical two qubit gate, which is pretty cool. Um, as we saw from Google before, I think they've done a great job showing the advantage of distance, particularly for um, even just this possible code, but that's still a very SMB demonstration. And then we heard a little bit um, from Rob about this nice work on design of codes from Yale. This is an example of like this GKP code. Um, I'll take a little bit of uh, uh, yeah. um, <laughs> So uh, Rob um, always says that um, the superconducting, these, these design codes are going to give us the only codes that have broken in. Um, and the thing which I would quibble about a little bit is that it only breaks even one dimension, or one, one, um, one dimension of places you want to break even. Um, so for uh, superconductors and like semiconductor qubits, like a real problem is T1 and T2. And so when they think about fixing errors, they think about increasing the memory. But when you work with like neutral atoms and ions, you never worry about the memory. It's like not, it's just not on your list of problems. Your problem is gates. And so you want to break even with these gates. And so what's true is the bosonic code is the only code uh, that has really shown a, a better, like a really nice um, increase in T1 and T2. But you can see on this plot that it came at the cost of spam. They've lost uh, their contrast with their qubits in exchange for having longer time. So in these experiments, um, our, our logical spam is actually better than our physical spam. So we broke even there. Um, and then again, like I mentioned in this continuum paper, they actually showed that a logical spam is better than a physical spam. So they broke even there. And then the thing which is really true is nobody is broken even. So what we want is the experiment where we like break even over all these things. Um, and that's a bit small uh, If you're watching the later, I'll just make it. Uh, okay, so the next thing um, on my soapbox is uh, I think fault tolerance is a design principle. Um, unfortunately, from my perspective, unfortunately in our community, a lot of people use fault tolerance as a uh, shortcut for like the computer works, <laughs> the quantum computer works, it is all time. But I actually think, um, I personally think that's not as useful, that, that, because fault tolerance is a design principle we borrowed from classical design. And it just says that as long as less than X things go wrong, the thing still works perfectly. But you cannot, you know, limit the number of things that go wrong, so it's just a design principle for making things better. So, to do that, you have to decide on what your faults are. So um, typically, we choose these poly errors because we have these nice poly codes. Uh, when we pick the codes, it's going to limit our operations. We have to think about how to do fault tolerant operations. So we usually have transversal case, say magic states. And then all of this leads to things getting better if we're below some threshold. So the other thing that I, um, I think when people first start reading the quantum um, error correction literature, which is hard, has to do with everybody has these different thresholds. So um, these numbers are not state of the art, but the, but the relative values is, is good. Um, so if I imagine I have a perfect code and I have perfect checks, um, then on, in one axis, my memory error can be about 10%. But on the logical model, um, says that sometimes the measurements um, go wrong, like you get the wrong information from the check, and the threshold falls a few percent. Um, I don't think the phenomenological model is that well motivated physically. Um, and 
people will sometimes um, you know, still call it fault tolerant because they mean fault tolerant to measurements. So you'll see like fault tolerant threshold of 3%. And you'll be like, wait, I thought it was 1% for the circuit model. But it's just a different set of faults. So you always have to ask people, like, what is your setup? So when we go to circuit errors, you get to 1%. So this, yeah, this is like a really old paper by um, Andrew Mandel. But if you look at a color code, code capacity is the same, phenomenologically the same, and the circuit model drops by a factor of 10. And so I think one of the hard things about what particularly we think about new codes, it's really, it's relatively easy to calculate code capacity. It's more challenging to calculate phenomenological, and it is very, very hard to calculate the circuit. And so you, how do you decide um, which things are worth calculating in the circuit model based on these earlier calculations? And I think just this simple example shows you that it's hard to tell. It's actually hard to tell. So um, these next couple of pictures are um, from Guillaume G. Clos Yancy. He was a grad student with um, uh, Jim Fruman. I really like them because they get across like what the real problem is like. So at the beginning, you know, when we have small codes, and I say, oh, this check one path, this check one path, um, and then we can sit down and play with it. But when we get near these thresholds, the checks here on the left, you can see where the errors, the X and Y errors, have created these errors on the surface code. In this picture, the qubits live on the edges. Um, Z checks uh, live on the faces, and X checks live on the vertices. Um, and but you don't have that error information. You just have all of those syndromes going off on the brain. And then you have to build a decoder, which is. So one thing which is really nice about the surface code is it has this minimum weight perfect patching decoder, which is relatively efficient. And we just try to make little blue-green links, which bring the domain walls together, you know, cancel the quasi-particles, um, and make it as small as possible. Try to move the domain walls as small as possible. Or the, um, the excitation is small as possible. But you can tell that as you get close to the threshold, like the difference between the, the, the minimum weight on this side and the weight on that side is pretty similar. This one fixes it, and that one on the right leads to a Right. So we need, so that's in terms of practicality, um, back to Dr. Chodi's point, the, like one other advantage of the surface code is the decoder is actually quite nice. When we think about these other codes, All right, but this is just the code capacity 10% error threshold I was talking about. So to quote, uh, yeah, Guillaume also made this nice picture, which tries to get across the time part. So in time, you're gonna see these errors come and go. And measurement errors will, will be like errors show up and share errors go. If the um, charges uh, corresponding to the defects move around, you see them Time. And so we have to do this three-dimensional um, model to try to understand how the yeah what what is the what is the threshold at the circuit model where all of these pieces can go wrong. Beyond that, we actually have to think about the circuits. Um, so we'll go back to this small surface code, and I just want to measure this check eleven. I know these four qubits zero one three four, and all of these control knots commute with each other. So without errors, these circuits are exactly the same. And then I'm going to put in a very mean error. So I put in an X error in the middle of this check circuit. I can't see it on the measurement. It doesn't exist there. Um, and it leads to two X errors on the data. Um, and so my student, a long time ago, Utvia, she was um, interning at Microsoft with Chris Soria, they show that for this rotated code, that there's a massive difference between these two things. Because when this X error propagates up the Z knots, you either get two X checks this way, or two X checks up and down. Or X errors up and down. You don't see errors, you just see checks. And now our decoder um, assumes we have a minimal number of errors. So where, where, what does my decoder do on this top one? I have two Z checks that are disconnected and have a, a check, or like 
jurisdiction on or that over push your magic coder put one X or two X's. Two X's here. Are there other options? Yeah, you can put the two X's here. But those two X's, by the by those times those two X's are stabilized, right? So that's fine. And then what about the bottom? How can I, this only single check goes off? Where can I have the X there? This check goes off, or should I put an extra? Yeah, on set. So when I do this, this one's fine, and this one generates a logical error. And this, to me, is like a, a challenge of fault tolerant construction, generically, is that you need, not only need a circuit which tells you how to get the information out, you need a way to make sure that circuit isn't propagating errors. Um, so, so in this case, what I like about it is we were able to realize that, that we can create the circuits by thinking about the underlying compass model. Um, and my student, Shilin, who's now a postdoc at Yale, uh, well, <laughs> so it's a series of things. So we first realized for, for, for um, short code, we can pull these things off. Then we realized in the circuit model and the phenomenological model we could pull it off. We had very strong evidence that it should work for the, for the circuit model, but no, um, <coughs> you know, no data. And then Shilin uh, basically showed that, that it works great for the circuit model, and it's pretty cool because it thank you very much, um, because it enables it, it enables you to do something I thought was impossible, which is measure a massive stabilizer with only a single central still be false on. But it's possible because of the structure there. And so these kind of codes based on uh, compass codes have been very useful. There's been a lot of great stuff. Um, I worked with the Norris group on simulations of short codes. This heavy hex code from IBM is also an example of that. Um, and then, of course, these surface codes also come from compass codes, but not, not initially. Um, so in the last couple of minutes, um, yeah, I want to. I want to say a little bit more about experiment. Um, I have way too many slides, so I'm just going to skip through some things. Um, but kind of like lessons learned from trying to do this bacon short code with Chris's group. So we have ion traps in an array. We get these nice traps from Sandia. We can control all the ions. We put it in a box that looks like that. We took all the data during COVID, so all the experimentalists were basically at home. Um, yeah, so this is Chris's group and uh, his research scientist postdocs and students at the time, um, Marcus Satina and Crystal Miller are now also faculty members at Duke. Um, so the way it works is we have this 15 ion chain, we encode into the vacant shore qubit state, and then we're able to do some operations. Um, if you think about the things we could do, we could encode, we could do the measurement, we could do logical gates. But we weren't able to do this multiple rounds of error correction. Yeah. So now I'm going to skip some stuff. Um, so the one thing I want to point out is uh, the fault tolerant gates are often transversal because you apply all of these operators, and if one goes bad, it's just one error. You can always apply a logical operator directly. There's nothing that stops you. So you can apply a logical operator in this case by making a very high weight rotation, which we just did. So when we think about codes, usually we have easy gates, which are canonical example like flip operations. And then we have transversal code deformations um, that's also kind of easy gates. Hard gates canonically is this pi over T gate. And then we have things like magic state distillation. Um, so the idea, um, you know, following, you know, you know, I, I just work on 
teleportation is basically all of them. All of quantum computing can become teleportation. Somehow, if I have just the right state, this magic state, and this is an example of where I wish I was in charge of naming things. Because uh, <laughs> in 2005, it's super hard to get a shot in quantum computing. And you're going around giving job talks where you're like, well, if you have these magic states, everything would work. It's like a, <laughs> it's terrible. They sell you a bean stock, and anyway. But, uh, but if we can make good magic states through distillation, we can actually go up to the steady state. And I think the thing which is um, my, my personal impression um, is all these examples I know of, they're basically always at least two codes. There's a code which is the main code for memory and doing most of your operations, and then somewhere there's hidden a second code which makes the hard gate easy on that code. And then you gotta get these two codes to talk to each other. So for example, um, in, in more work by Beverland, uh, Beverland Kubica and Sora, uh, distillation starts with these T states, but if you look at that distillation circuit, it is the decoding circuit for a code in which T gates are transversal. Or, you could imagine going from a 2D color code, which has transversal clippers, to a 3D color code, which has transversal keys, and basically apply, like, like most of the time you live in the 2D code, I always imagine this pyramid is like a, like a giant spaceship that comes from outer space, lands on the Earth, allows you to do your TDA, takes off again, comes back. Um, yeah. And so in the end, this cost is very high, and, um, I'm sorry, I lost the edge of So this is from Rutinsky's Game of Surface Codes. And basically, this cost of doing the non-clipper operation dominates these all time quantum computations. And, and thinking about ways to route them and do them faster and easier is really critical. Um, but I still think, um, again, there's like more room to explore. It because you're not only exploring one code, which is like the memory set, we should also spend more time exploring the second code, which is like what operations are available, and whether you need just one second code or you have actually multiple different codes. Yeah. Um, so this, uh, yeah. So why do we not do repeated measurements? I mean, the real reason is at the time we didn't have um, intermediate measurements. The secondary reason is that our stabilizer measurements weren't great. We would get kind of like 20%. 20% off. So here, we would add errors, and we measure our stabilizer check. So we add no errors. Um, we would want this to be zero. But due to the errors in our system in the gates, it ends up being about 20%, which is too high to gain any information from these to fix things. So we could repeat it, but we wouldn't gain any more information. I also like this plot because uh, um, you know, one of the great things about quantum simulation in the near-term era uh, is we can do all this nice error mitigation stuff. And I think one of the reasons why it's very hard to, to convince experimentalists to do quantum error correction experiments is it's very unforgiving <laughs> because there is no error mitigation. So I could easily error mitigate these guys down to zero <laughs> and up to one. It'd be simple if it was just an expectation value. But because I need to make choices off single bits, it's not quite good. Um, and then this is my, uh, um, I, I'm a little bit in the minority on fault tolerance. Yeah, I probably am in the minority on this fault tolerance design principle. I'm evangelizing it all the time to summer school, so I hope people <laughs> join me eventually. But when we put in the paper, of course, the reviewer said, you have this fault tolerant stabilizer measurement, but you haven't proven it's fault tolerant. And I wrote back, it's just a design principle. <laughs> And they said, uh, no. <laughs> um, so I asked Laird, who's the main experimentalist grad student, I said, okay, Laird, let's just put in an error here, which is parameterized by this angle. And then I have two circuits to do the stabilizer measurement. The good circuit, fault tolerant, and the bad circuit, not fault tolerant. The reason why we had to add the error is that if we didn't add any error, there was no difference in the outcome of these two scenarios. 
so actually, Larry did that experiment first, and he was very unhappy with me, because I promised him that this left one was way better than the right one. But what happened in the experiment was that this fault of having a Z error happen during this intro measurement, Laird, the experimentalist, it basically made zero. So I'm protecting against a fault, which just doesn't happen. So when we turn it on and we let the fault happen, you see that the fault uh, tolerant method um, still gives you really good results, even if with 100% certainty there's an error, which is, the, which is what it means to be fault tolerant. If with 100% certainty there's an error, it should still work. Um, and then the non-fault tolerant one falls off this experiment. The other thing has to do with, um, from, uh, which was really useful from the experiment, was this question about real physical error rates. So when you're an error correction theorist, you always write down the stabilizers, and you never write down the state. Um, and actually that, uh, yeah, and, and when you teach your quantum error correction class, usually students are always like, well, what's the state? And you're like, I don't know. <laughs> I know how, I, I can tell you how to make it because I know what all the stabilizers are, um, but I never think about the state. So this was kind of a funny example of um, the flaw. <laughs> so the, um, in this short code, because we usually use um, positive logical Z stabilizers, we form paramagnets. And then the logical state are these GHC states. And if you want to make a quantum sensor, which is you know, optionally sensitive to magnetic fields, you would make GHC states. So we're like, effectively making the thing, like the, the worst possible state if you have correlated magnetic fields. On accident, because <laughs> we're not looking well then. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit. But, but because we read too many quantum error regression books, we just have positive Zs. If I just switch those stabilizers, instead of stabilizing ZZ, I stabilize minus ZZ, then, um, I then get these little anti-paramagnets. And then suddenly, you have something which is pushing towards a decoherence free subspace for correlated noise. And the, the logical G2 time, which is again something I'm not that worried about, um, becomes way better. And then actually, you do similar things for specific codes on this nice paper by Robert and his, his group um, to make an actual DFS by making these things. So this is a this kind of correlated phase error is outside of this normal polyaric model. And it makes those different subspaces inequivalent. And that's generically going to be true. So in your real system, you're going to have very different errors. And then you should, even if you're using a stabilized, you know, usual stabilizer codes, you should think about which of those code spaces is the best based on the error you actually have. Um, I'm skipping this erasure and leakage stuff, we can talk about it later. I just want to thank a little bit of my students, so me and you uh, have some nice erasure work that I didn't talk about, so I'm happy to talk about it. Um, what we did with Wes. Uh, all these other students, um, this is from QIP in 2020, where we were in China in January in 2020. <laughs> Thankfully, we all got back. I think Chilin was on the last slide out. Um, but I'm really, uh, these, these students help a lot with the bacon short codes and stuff and other error correction stuff. And I'm actually, um, I don't know, I guess kind of like the crowd advisor because Natalie is on the continuum paper which has this better C naught, logical C naught, the physical C naughts. Mike and Drypto made the just help on the distance five Google paper. And out of the four people who talked about it at Google Symposium, there were two of them. Uh, Milan is on the heavy hex code at EM. Uh, anyway, Mary Ann worked for Robert, who's now at the University of Arizona, always looking for students and postdocs. Catherine's at MIT, but I think she's doing neuroscience now, that's fine. I'll take the hit. Um, yeah, and she lives, she, lives, she lives now a postdoc at Yale. Um, but yeah, I'm super excited these things are going well. And I just wish I would have had all of them sign the agreement to never do better science than me before they left. Because <laughs> uh, it's getting kind of tough. Anyway, yeah, I'll take some questions for five minutes. <laughs> Yeah, there's the reference. Yeah. What's your thoughts about bias preserving code? Is it a direction worth taking or is it going to be a dead end? I think
think um, I think it's worth I think it's worth taking if you have the ability to do these crash preserving gates. So I have not focused on it that much because in ions that's not really readily available. But I think it's a nice example of how the physical noise changes the physical vault, and then you can use it. Both, right? I do think this um, these bias codes that stuff helps you anyway. So like the XCCX method of the surface code is quite nice. Shruti's recent work on these um, uh, cluster state sort of things. Uh, I think it's really, yeah, I think that stuff's good. But for me, I, I haven't focused too much on the bias preserving because I don't know how to pull it off in the antitrust. Yeah. So, um, so, so the the forty the in some sense, right? You can think of the surface code as just two one di models, which is why it doesn't have a, um, which is why it's Hamiltonian doesn't have like a critical temperature. But the forty Tori code, which is from this Dennis Kattai kind of festival paper, um, which is a really important paper. The, they show in 40 the wood application position. But it's basically because you stuck together two 2D um, ice models. And I think it's still an open question if you can pull it off the 3D. So there's evidence of um, you, you, you can get kind of close. Um, and so, for example, the cubic code gets kind of close. But the cubic code can turn out to be great. So to me, that's the, like, and actually, Dave Bacon's original plan for the compass model was he wanted to self correct mode. And it led to subsystem codes and all kinds of other stuff. So I think, you know, so it's back to my main soapbox point. It's just amazing, like, you try to build this quantum memory, it never works. But the thing that's falling out is often great. So I recommend. Yeah, so, um, so I do think, you know, for example, um, error mitigation where you mitigate on falling out of the subspace is kind of a fault tolerant procedure. It says that you can detect, right? Because like, each of those um, simulation subspaces in the quantum simulation space, you can basically think of as code spaces. So maybe you're trying to um, simulate a molecule. The way we often do it, like, you don't act, there could be an error which adds an electron or removes an electron. And if you can detect that at the end, that, that's, that's an example. The other examples have to do with, um, um, uh, I think of them as assertions. So, um, uh, so, so, yeah, motivated by work from Martin Marnosi and Nan Zhao, um, you basically add a little circuit, which is kind of like a flag circuit. You're not doing error correction. You're just using this flag circuit to check that within this block, um, no fault is done. So those are those are some examples. Yeah. And well, actually, the other example I like in terms of verification is I think it's really useful to have different platforms work on the same simulation problem because then you kind of have your tolerant to like one platform fail. So the problem, so the problem is, but so, um, so let's not, let's just have a, let's just have unitary operators. So if I have a unitary Z rotation, which is at the same angle, um, because of the stabilizer, 
basically makes all of the Z's on that line go away. That angle rotates three times as fast. And therefore, I get out of the code space three times faster. And that's why people, that's why GHZ states um, are good for the sensitivity. And that's why this other negative Z stabilizer is better here, if I have that correlated data. Now, it also works in a um, dissipated regime. So um, if I have a Lindblad operator in which I have a correlated um, T2 over the over the um, yeah, over the humans, uh, then it then this has also this problem that the T2 of the GHC state will be much faster than you expect for multiplying the individuals. Um, and yeah, and for us basically the magnetic field noise is spatially correlated. And so that, that's the thing. And so the magnetic field noise, which is so fast that it looks to us like um, dissipated processes, uh, it's still correlated in space. So, so. Well, since it's low and less can be to do this, right? Okay, but one more question. Okay. I guess you can uh, finish it. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, please give a so we, we will have a session, a problem solving session at, uh, starting from 11 30, but you know, uh, some of us include the international for leaving. So uh, yeah, let's give us uh, uh, all the lectures in the summer school and for ourselves a big round of applause for.